Ricky ready? <laughs> Have one minute with everybody else. Thank you for bra braving the weather and emerging stronger together as we develop and understand better our history and our architectural uh, symbols in the building tonight. The meeting will come to order. Devotions is Nancy Sutherland. So I have taken this devotion from one that is on the UCC site, and I've modified it some. So it is entitled, A Restorer of Life. The woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. Five verses into the book of Ruth, her mother-in-law Naomi had lost her husband and two sons. By verse 14, Naomi's daughter-in-law Orpah had turned back to her own home. Only Ruth, the other daughter-in-law, herself a widow, accompanies Naomi as she makes her way back to Bethlehem. If ever there was someone who walked the valley of death, it was Naomi. By the book's end, Naomi's journey has taken a different direction. Ruth marries Naomi's kinsman, Boaz, and bears a son. The village women rejoice with old Naomi and proclaim that the baby shall be to you a restorer of life. You probably know a few such restorers of life. For me, a restorer of life during the last 19 months of COVID disruption has been my frequent suppers with Tom and Nancy Conforti. Perhaps for some of you, it has been teen a teenage son or daughter who after several days of challenging behavior, comes home from school behaving as a totally cheerful, happy kid. Restorers of life come in all ages, sizes, and colors. Sometimes they are part of our lives for many years, sometimes only for a moment when their smile or word of encouragement blesses and brings us back to life. In this season of Thanksgiving, may we remember and give thanks for such restorers in our lives. So let us pray, God of love and giver of life, thank you for all who have restored our lives. Amen. Thank you, Nancy. Susan, caring report. There's a microphone down there for her. If you flip it on, it, the battery will light. Hello. Um, you received the caring report 
uh, and it remains the same. We have a number of people who are facing difficult issues. Um, but the one that I would like to add is Beth Brouchard, who many of you know, and who has moved to Princeton, who is having a number of issues with her ankles, her hips, everything hurts. <laughs> and uh, she's facing surgery and also the birth of her first grandchild, uh, a daughter, uh, or a baby girl, tomorrow. It was supposed to be the due date anyway. Um, so. Uh, please remember those people in your prayers, and also um, anybody who's traveling for Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll, uh, we hope for the very best for safe travel and uh, healthy habits. At this time, Nancy DiCiccio will give the, a short treasures report. evening. I have an abbreviated report for us this evening. The current balance in the Women's Society checking account is $33,806.84, and of that, $12,525 will soon be distributed as directed by the Susan Bonnevere Legacy Memorial Committee. $950.75 is being held as it was specified for future memorial receptions and $1,895 will be sent to charities that received donations through our rummage reimagined, leaving us a balance of $18,436.09, and our CD balance is $20,048.33. Thank you. Are there any questions for Nancy? If not, the report will be filed for audit. At this time, Ellen Russell will come forward. She's on the program committee. She's the chair with Nancy Sutherland and Nancy O'Brien, and she will introduce our speaker for tonight. Good evening. Ooh, the audience has grown since I came in before. How nice, that's lovely. Um, so glad to have everybody here. This is the first time that the Women's Society has had um, a general meeting in the evening. We, uh, we ha usually have about five general meetings um, a year uh, in addition to the meetings that we have at home, the home chapters. Uh, and so there's a, a theme or a presenter or something interesting, but we feel tonight is really different having this for the first time in the evening and having Rich be here to um, talk with us about the church, the history of the church, and the architecture. I thought this was a grand program. When um, my husband, Rich, and I uh, became uh, members about four years ago, uh, during our, uh, the time that we spent learning about the church and um, being welcomed in and meeting many people, uh, I think the speech that Rich gave us um, the new members that month about uh, about where we worship and how long people have worshipped here and in the other buildings that have uh, been part of this church um, was really inspiring and the history is terrific. So we welcome Rich tonight and thank you very much for speaking with us. So glad some of you are here, some of you are with us online. Ricky knows, but I, the, the story is going to start up here. First, I do, I do want to make a quick announcement. Sunday morning is uh, our worship, 9 and 1030 here and online. And it's also um, the Thanksgiving Alphabet Sunday. People always ask me to remind them when that's coming up. So why am I starting up here as I tell you the history of the First Congregational Church of Western Springs? By the way, it begins, our original name is the Congregational Church of Western Springs. Uh, there was no first when they, when they first named us. I'm standing here because in 1928, when the building committee of this church spoke to the architect, they said that their pastor at the time, the Reverend John Wells Rahill, they said he had a troubling kind of characteristic, and this was in the old church, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. 
He wandered when he spoke. And they said, build us a pulpit with very little movement space in it so when he preaches, he will be standing in one place. So since 1929, when this sanctuary was dedicated, most of the sermons have been preached from here. It's a fairly narrow path in and up. However, in a few minutes, I'm going to wander because I feel more comfortable doing that. But Mrs. Rahill, John Wells Rahill's wife, uh, was, was also credited with giving Women's Society its current structure of the chapters and the, the monthly meetings. It had existed long before that, since the 1890s, but she helped reshape it into what you consider it, its current structure. But John Wells Rahill, who liked to wander, was a little bit controversial before he got here and might be now, but they didn't know so much when he was here. John Wells Rahill came to us from a very prominent church in Topeka, Kansas, the Congregational Church of Topeka, Kansas. How he ended up in Topeka, I have no idea, except because he was an East Coaster. He went to Williams College, Yale Divinity School, and ended up in Topeka, Kansas. And, and by the way, as an aside, a number of the stories that I'll share with you tonight, you'll think, now how does Rich know that about this person? I've talked to a lot of their relatives. I had a long conversation with John Wells Rahill's granddaughter just a couple of years ago. But one of the things that John Wells Rahill thought was going to be a great idea and got him in trouble in Topeka, Kansas, is that this new fangled invention could be really useful in telling the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. This newfangled idea that he began to use were movies. This is in the 1920s. It was extremely controversial. Going to the movies was considered sometimes a very um, risque event. He thought it had great potential to tell the story. He left Kansas, I don't think very happily, but came to the First Congregational Church of Western Springs where he um, began to lead the church starting in the early 1920s, about 1924. He is responsible for ending up doing the campaign and the dreams of building this church. However, here's something that you may find surprising about John Wells Rahill. Um, he was considered a wonderful preacher um, and a great thinker. But John Wells Rahill, um, during World War I, was a young man uh, and was not in the service, but worked with the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association. And at the end of the war, they sent him in one of their many numerous overseas sort of missions to Russia to see what was going on in the revolution in Russia. Now, John Wells Rahel was not a communist, but what he did was he documented with these old beautiful slides the Russian revolution. And about Five years ago, I read in the San Francisco Examiner, they found them in his granddaughter's attic, and they're on display all over the world because he, he actually documented via photos the Russian Revolution. Now, here's what his granddaughter told me he always said he had to keep very quiet in all the churches he served, is that he was a socialist. So yes, for about 12 years, a socialist was in the pulpit of our church. And at the time, though, Christian socialism was a broadly held movement in America. It was a combination of, it wasn't against capitalism, but it was a sense of equality in economic um, disparities. The most prominent Christian socialist at the time was Reinhold Niebuhr. You may or may not know his name, but he was probably the most important Christian theologian in the United States of the 19, in, in, the 19, in the 20th century. So John Wells Rahill, though, his, his granddaughter told me, um, always felt he had to keep that under wraps. But I'm gotten, I've gotten ahead of myself. So about the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to share with you, I think, some nuggets of history about our church and then the architecture of our sanctuary and how they come together. And I might introduce to you some people that you've maybe heard me mention in sermons, but I might do so more fully. Well, our story as a church begins in 1887 when we're gathered as the Congregational Church of Western Springs. Congregational churches are not founded, they're gathered. That's the appropriate term because a church is, in the congregational tradition, the congregation. You don't found the people, you gather the people. So we were gathered for the first time in 1887 by Reverend Armstrong, and he was the pastor of the Lionsville Congregational Church, which is out at Joliet Road and Wolf Road, the oldest 
oldest church uh, by far of any of any flavor or denomination out here is that is Lyonsville. It was founded in 1855, 10 years before the end of the Civil War. There was nothing, nothing out here. But Reverend Armstrong would ride his horse down the old East Plank Road, now Wolf Road, uh, for about 10 years, Sunday afternoons, and lead a Bible study here in <clears throat> what was just a, an unincorporated village until 1886. So Western Springs is incorporated the year before we become officially a congregational church. And our first pastor was the Reverend P.W. Perry, and he came from Dowagiac, Michigan. And he writes us, and it's in the archives, this beautiful letter. I mean, an absolutely beautiful letter. And what a way to begin the covenant of being the pastor with a congregation. He writes to them and says, and writes to us still, I do not come expecting a perfect congregation. You should not expect a perfect pastor. Together, together, he said, despite our foibles and our stumbles, we will seek to bear one another's burdens in Christ's name. What a beautiful way to begin a pastorate. You won't find a perfect pastor. I don't expect a perfect congregation, but but despite our stumbles, we will bear one another's burdens in Christ's name. Congregational Church was founded with roughly 24 charter members in 1887. And in the, uh, in the 25th anniversary of the church, they wrote a little booklet, which is in our archives, and they celebrate their diversity. Even then, at their founding, they said, we had five Presbyterians, there were four Methodists, three Lutherans, two Congregationalists. They describe one, and I don't know how they use this word, I love this, one aggressive disciple, which is a disciple of Christ, an aggressive disciple of Christ. I think they meant an evangelist. But then the last one, the last one is a phrase that's always stuck with me. It's kind of elusive, but I love it. And they celebrate and they say, and after listening to all these denominations, they say, and one um, useful Unitar um, Orthodox Unitarian. One very useful Orthodox Unitarian. I don't know exactly what they meant, but they were very proud of their uh, uh, useful Orthodox Unitarian. Well, the congregation began worshiping in what is now the Grand Avenue Community Center at that time. They had worshiped on the third floor of it for about seven years. And one of the, one of the early pillars of this church was a woman named Emma Parrish, who was just a little girl in the 1887, in 1887. And she wrote a remembrance and said that it was lovely. And, if, and some of you may remember, may have grown up in traditions where you went to church twice on Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. That was common in almost every denomination that you had. A, that's how you observe the Sabbath, morning worship, evening worship. Preacher offered two different sermons, two different services. She said in the evening services on the third floor of the Grand Avenue School, she said in the summer, she said we would be singing and the cicadas would be singing with us. And uh, she said it was this, this glorious memory of her childhood of worshiping in the school. But they decided it's time to build a proper church and they build the first um, congregational church building, which would have been just to the north of where Grand Avenue Community Center is now. There's a house there now, but that's where the first church was. And if you've grown up in the Midwest, and especially if you grew up in a small town in the Midwest, you've seen the kind of church that they built. I, um, I'd call it sort of the equivalent of, this, of a, a ch the ecclesiastical Sears house because they came really almost as a, um, as a kit. And you could assemble them yourselves or hire carpenters. And you walked up about five steps into the sanctuary. There was no office up there. It was just the sanctuary. You walked down a few steps into the basement, which would have been the fellowship hall, and they pulled curtains across to make up the Sunday school room. There was no offices. There was no study. The pastor's study would have been in his parsonage. And they, they begin to, uh, to worship there for, for quite some time. And, and now I'm going to pick up on a story that, that Catherine shared Sunday morning because we had talked about it um, before her sermon. 1899, um, in February of 1899, the church brings Reverend Frederick Jolly out to our church. He was a Chicago Theological Seminary student. And he comes out, and he must have had um, 
not only a um, evangelical fervor about him, he clearly had an apocalyptic fervor about him. By the way, 1899, start of the 20th century, was in the United States, the parts of our nation was, were on fire with the idea that the rapture was about to come at the start of the, of the next millennium. Because if you believed in the millennialists, as they're called, you would, you, some thought that first you must commit to Christ and then at the, end of the, at the end of the rapture, you'll be lifted up. Others would say you committed um, after the end of the millennium. But to some, the start of the 20th century set this nation on an apocalyptic fervor that really has never been matched. And Reverend Frederick Jolly was one of those. He convinced about seven members of our church to go out to, on, on Grand Avenue, out to the um, steps of the church with their bags packed, for when the clock struck 1201 of 1900, they would be lifted up in the apocalypse. Now, um, it was not a terribly uncommon uh, feeling at the time, but if there's a lesson to be learned, and by the way, when I first read about this in our, in our archives and did some research at Chicago Theological Seminary on him, I thought at first, because they're handwritten notes, I thought this is perfect. I thought his last name, I thought it wasn't Jolly, I thought it was an F. Folly. I thought, isn't this ironically perfect? Reverend Folly, who did this, but it's jolly. And so he, um, as, as Catherine mentioned in her sermon, at the February annual meeting of 1900, Reverend Jolly's um, resignation was accepted. Because the, 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 the teaching is that if you're going to predict the apocalypse, you better be right. So here's the best part, though. So I went at Chicago Theological Seminary where they used to have a congregational archives because I wanted to find out what happened to him. And you can look in each of the congregational yearbooks. 1901, he's still listed as studying. In 1902, he's listed as um, address unknown. In 1903, there's a little Latin phrase under his name. It says, in transitio in transit. Maybe he was lifted up in the apocalypse, and it was just three years early in his guess, but that's the last Fre the Reverend Frederick Jolly is, is heard from. Well, we come to the 1920s in the life of this church, and Western Springs is finally growing. By the way, Reverend Perry, when he wrote that beautiful note accepting the first call as our as to be our pastor, he also adds, and there's this wonderful line, he said, I do have at least one concern about coming to, to your village. He said, there are no houses there. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's a, that's a challenge for evangelism. And by the 1920s, Western Springs and, and the other suburbs around here had begun to, to grow in size. And um, John Wells Rayhill arrives, and the Woman's Society plays a very important role in supporting something that is, this is the only time in our history that we had this, our um, missionary, our minister abroad, the Reverend Ralph Kiten. John Wells Rahill was listed on our bulletin as the minister at home. Jo uh, Reverend Ralph Kiten is listed as our minister abroad. He was in India and he was supported by this church. He had graduated from Chicago Theological Seminary. He had gone to a small little congregational college, which is my daughter's alma mater in, in Minnesota, called Carleton College. He was from Minnesota, rural Minnesota. The Reverend Ralph Kiten became a missionary, and his wife was one of the first um, women graduates of the University of Chicago's medical school, and together they went off to India. And he, too, is rather controversial. In fact, there's even a story in which he's talked about in the New York Times, he's talked about in the Chicago Tribune. He was a missionary who said, very intentionally, and this was controversial in our congregation as well, that he was not, not going to India to convert Hindus, and there were a lot of Muslims at the time as well in different parts of India, but to not to convert Hindus to Christianity, but rather to be a glimpse of God's love to people who are in need. So he intentionally said, I will not go to convert people. I will go to be a glimpse of God's love. His wife was going to be the medical doctor. And he also did something that was unheard of as well, is that he said, I will not live in the missionary compounds. And missionaries lived very well, extremely well. And he said, I will only live as the poorest of the poor do. And, and this became a struggle. I've talked to uh, John Wells Rahill's um, not, no, to Ralph Kiten's daughter-in-law, who happened to be a retired UCC minister in North Dakota now, he said that became a challenging issue for 
her mother-in-law, they eventually divorced, she was a doctor, she said, I will help alleviate these, um, this impoverishment and these unsafe settings, but they had two children. She said, I'm not comfortable raising our children in those. And um, so, in fact, the, the daughter and I talked to her husband, who had also been a UCC pastor, um, was raised in India until his mother and his sister, and he came back from, from India. But Ralph Kiten said, I will not convert souls, but show that glimpse of Christ's love to the poorest of the poor. And here's something, because I'm going to come to the architecture in a few minutes, that he writes to us, because we have all his letters. He, he corresponded with, um, and, and you're going to have to help me with her name, Lucy Williams. L Williams is her last name, Lucy um, Williams, who was the church secretary and lived up the street. And he writes us a letter in, in 1929, and he said, I am so, so sorry to hear that you've built your new church. He said, if you saw the world I see, you wouldn't spend a dime on building anything new. You would care for these people who are suffering so tragically. I, about every couple of years, I go back to that letter because it's a reminder to not make an idol out of the things that we may love, have built, and cherish. But Ralph Kiten wrote to us and said how deeply disappointed he was in the building of the church. He was also controversial, and this became really problematic here in our church, is that he became very active in the Indian independence movement. So free from the colonial um, occupation of the British, he gets kicked out of India twice by the British, and we are aghast at the fact that our missionary has been twice been considered a lawless um, revolutionary, and he, um, he actually ends up living the rest of his life in India. He died considering himself a Hindu Christian. His daughter-in-law told me that when he did come back to the United States a couple times to visit, he was so accustomed to the way that he would live that he couldn't even think of sleeping in a bed. He just slept on the floor of the grandchildren's bedroom. But anyhow, the Ralph Kiten has uh, this beautiful memorial to him in India and even a day of recognition because he, um, he became the American sort of advisor to Gandhi. He was extremely well known in India, and I'm going to use this term because this is how the Indians referred to him at the time, though it's a, it's a sort of inappropriate term. They called him Gandhi's white hand man. And so he spent a great deal of time working diligently and in fighting for Indian independence from the Brits. Well, it is still the 1920s here, and the church over on uh, Grand Avenue was growing too small. They began to dream of building a new church, and the first thing they had to do was acquire some land. Land was becoming more expensive in the 1920s. It was a fairly robust economic period in the United States. So they bought, and they put together with, some, some, with a capital campaign, they bought what they thought was an absolutely huge piece of property. We sit on currently 14 pieces of property. They, they thought it was more than enough. In fact, where our parking lot is now, we didn't even own that. There was a house on there on that piece of property until about 1950 when they bought that land to build the first parking lot. They thought everyone would walk to church or park on the streets. So it was a very, very different time. And as they, um, they, begin to, they begin to think about what a new church might look like, one of the members of the church saw a building by George Grant Elmsley, who becomes our architect, and actually saw it um, in Kansas as well. Elmsley had done some building all over the country after he'd left Louis Sullivan's firm. Elmsley, prior to going out on his own, for about 15 to 20 years was Louis Sullivan's chief designer. Louis Sullivan, the great Chicago commercial architect. He did the auditorium, he did the old stock exchange. Um, and many of you know what used to be called the Carson Perry Scott Building. Most of you would know it as that name, right? Has the beautiful bronze work around it, right? Well, that bronze work, like the stencils and, and much of the work in here, all that bronze work was designed by George Grant Elmsley. He was Louis Sullivan's chief decorative architect. And so um, 
the, the building committee, some names that will be familiar to you, Mr. Um, Edward McClure, Mr. John Laidlaw, Mr. Thomas Ford, were all on the building committee in the 1920s to begin to put together um, what this plan was going to be. And they, they convinced they, that Elmsley, that he'll, if he can design a church for them, he really had never designed a church before this. And like every self-respecting um, church in America in the 1920s, we wanted a Gothic looking church, a Gothic kind of small cathedral. Elmsley hated Gothic or neo-Gothic. And he writes to us and we have a the letter in the archives where he says, um, Gothic architecture was once truly great architecture, but neo-Gothic is nothing but a bloodless simulacrum of what was once truly great work. Still, he needed the work and he wanted the commission and so he designs for them a Gothic church that he knows they can't afford. I have actually a copy of the original design in, in, my, in my office. And in the middle, right about here, in this square area, was a soaring Gothic tower. And it looks almost exactly like the Tribune Tower. The Tribune Tower competition had happened just a year before Elmsley does this design. And so it's this soaring Gothic tower. It looks like a mini Tribune Tower. And then Gothic arches all the way around. They, um, he shows it to them. They look at the costs and they're aghast. They're like, we could never afford this. We think Elmsley absolutely knew that and just simply over-designed something so they wouldn't try to build it. And, um, and then comes back with this design. But so now, and, and those of you who are watching home, it's a little harder, so you have to imagine. Look up, if you can, and you see the Gothic arches here in our church, which Elmsley would have never included in a prairie-style church if he could have gotten away. But he knew he wanted the commission, so he includes the Gothic arches. The outside of our church, as you walk up from almost any direction, looks a lot like an English country church. Yellow stone, slate roof. Well, that makes sense because Elmsley designed what he knew. Elmsley was born in Aberdeen, Scotland. He lived there until he was 16 or 17 years old, and he had never designed a church before and must have remembered what they looked like. So we look like an English country church on the outside, a Gothic church up in the, in the ceiling, but then here in the sanctuary, it's a prairie-style church. And you're, many of you are probably familiar with the prairie style, mostly through Frank Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright. And, and to architectural historians, many of them consider George Grant Elmsley to be the second or maybe third finest prairie school architect in our, in our nation's history. But the prairie school was meant to be part of the landscape, which is why it's horizontal. It's called the cantilevered eaves of a prairie school home. Are supposed to carry your eye along the landscape. Frankly, Wright, Elmsley, they all thought you shouldn't build something that stands against, against the prairie. You, you build something that blends into it. Now think about that theologically, because Elmsley really did, and he writes to us, I think a prairie-style church is perfect for a congregational church. And he, because if you think about it, if you've been to Europe and you've gone to a cathedral, and you walk in, and the first thing you do is you look up, and you are astonished you are in awe and and that's exactly what the idea of a cathedral is supposed to do it helps you think of, of the god who is beyond us the god who is mysterious who is the who is other and that is a part of who god is right the god who is beyond us god isn't just simply a nicer kinder version of you and me but god is something more than that something mysterious but god is also in our midst and elmsley said in a congregational church with the congregation being the highest earthly authority because we come together to discern together God's, as best as we're able to, God's will, uh, understanding of who we are to be. Elmsley said the prairie school will remind, the prairie style will remind people of the God in our midst, the imminence of God. Now you probably know the great Advent hymn, um, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means God with us, and it gives us the word imminence. And so when Elmsley speaks of the imminence of God, he wanted us to, and I'll, tell, and I'll show you a little bit how he tried to do it, to remind us of the God who's in our midst. And think about how we serve communion. We, you don't, occasionally you'll come forward, but normally you're served in the pews, and you serve 
um, your, your loved one next to you or your friend or the stranger next to you. And, and we serve each other. And we are reminded by the presence and the divine spirit in each of us. So, for those of you who are here, look back over your shoulders for a moment. And you see the wood, it's called a string course. And it forms the top of the door jams, right? And it's a little peculiar looking once you realize that, but it runs right through the, it is the door jams, the top of the door jams. And then follow along through the windows with your eyes and you see the, con the cement, I mean the stone um, horizontal beams that carry that through. And then it's carried all the way up towards the front through here. It's the height of the pulpit as well, right? Because in the congregational church, the, the, the clergy are one of us. They're part of the congregation. So the pulpit is still sort of brought into the level of the congregation. And it runs all the way across. Remember, originally the organ pipes aren't there. So the only thing, the only thing above the string course is the cross. And it's carried all the way through. And then the stenciling. These are replicas of the original stencils that were in the sanctuary. Again, Elmsley wanted to carry that horizontal feel so that we would think of the God in our midst when we come together for the worship and praise of God. And so they, they like his design. They commission him. They build the church. And in 1929, it's completed. The first Sunday is Easter Sunday of 1929. And, as many of you know, as our history continues, uh, in October of 1929, the stock market crashes. The economy makes a, a bit of a rebound, but then it crashes again into, by, the by 1931, 32, through about 35, America is plunged into its greatest economic crisis in its history, the Great Depression. 1934, unemployment in America is 24.7%. I mean, an absolutely incomprehensible figure. And they've been struggling here. They'd done a capital campaign. They had hoped to um, uh, pay off as much of the loan to the, to the local bank as possible. By 1934, going into their uh, annual budget, they weren't even able to make fully the interest payments on the, on the mortgage that they had on this building. People who had made commitments may have lost their jobs, but they didn't lose their jobs. Wages were depressed tremendously. People were unable to fulfill their commitments. This church had planned in 1929. They were, did a five-year plan. They did them even back then. They thought in 29 by 1934 they would have a budget of about $40,000. Their budget going into 1934 was $8,000, 20% of what they thought it would be. They even note in their, um, in their annual meeting notes that they had um, taken out the They'd been so proud they had a telephone. They took out the telephone. They took out extra light bulbs. They did everything they could to save as much pos money as possible. They did something that I don't highly recommend. They cut their pastor's salary in half, but when you have to do what you have to do. And then they did two remarkable things. And what they did, I think that spirit can, is continued even today, close to 90 years later. They increased two areas of their budget, even though they cut everything else. They increased their mission giving um, because they said more neighbors, both those that we know by name and those whose names are not known to us, are in need. And they increased the amount of support for the Christian formation of their children and youth. And they said, because um, telling the good news of God's love to the generations that follow is one of the most important things we can do as a, as a church. So they cut as many things as they possibly could, but they also found a way to continue to serve others and the next generation. Um, I think that's just a remarkable spirit. I've told that story so many times, and every time I tell it, it, um, it kind of gives me goosebumps because I, um, I think that spirit continues to this day. Well... The, the 1930s are past. Ed, the Reverend Robert Stubbs comes to our church in the 1930s. And um, in, the, in the heart of the Depression, uh, 
John Wells Rahel had moved on. He went to become senior pastor of a cathedral church, the church, the first congregational church of Los Angeles, which is a huge church out on the West Coast. Reverend Stubbs wrote to this congregation in Thanksgiving of 1934, coming up on Thanksgiving, which is why I pulled this out. He, um, he acknowledged the, the terrible situation the nation and many individuals were in. And this is what he said. He said, Thanksgiving in 1934 may sound like a sarcastic irony. An interesting start. Thanksgiving in 1934 may sound like a sarcastic irony, given the economic crisis we are in. However, he said to this congregation, if you examine your hearts closely, you will surely find so many things for which to be grateful that cannot be purchased with coin or currency. One more kind of controversy of the 1930s. We'll call this death in the cathedral. Church is fairly new. No one really knew this, but they, they asked George Grant Elmsley to put three little crypts at the base of the uh, pulpit. Um, a member of the church died, and his family had uh, his um, ashes interred in the base of the pulpit. People did not know about this until they discovered it in people began to hear about the story. Um, people then began to write letters to both the pastor and the moderator at the time and said, until those ashes are removed, we're not coming back to church. And for about three months, hardly anybody came to church until the ashes were actually removed. And, um, and it was, it's a rather startling thing. I thought, well, how do we get to that? And, and actually, the one of the former um, building managers told me that it's all been, it's all been cemented over, so they're, they're no longer down there. Um, in the 1950s, let me see what we're doing here. I'll wrap this up. Ed Manthai, Manthai Chapel, um, Ed is named after. Ed Manthai came here, and there was, um, there was quite a controversy in Western Springs and in the life of this church as well near the end of the 1950s. Dr. and Mrs. Falls moved to Western Springs, um, which doesn't sound very controversial, except that Dr. and Mrs. Falls were the first African-American couple to decide to move to an all-white suburb at the time. Um, West, some people in Western Springs tried to get the piece of lot bought as a park so that no home could be built there. Um, Mrs. Falls had been a member of Park Manor Congregational Church, which is down near Hyde Park. Um, she came and, and sat with Ed Manti and said, I, you know, I would like to transfer my membership would that be okay? And if I did so, would that be a problem? Ed Manti um, apparently shared with her and said, we would welcome your presence. And then she said, but would that be a problem? He said, we'd welcome your presence. And apparently she said, but what will happen? He said, well, I will be honest with you. There will be a significant number of people who will leave, but that would be their problem and not ours. Um, they, she did not join. Um, and yes, there were numerous members of our church who were a part of the group that hoped to both support them, but a, there were numerous members of our church who also um, worked to try to buy the piece of property and have it condemned. And so it was uh, a particularly um, difficult time, but maybe just a precursor for the 1960s. When Ken Syme arrived here in 1960 to be our senior pastor, Ken Syme, after whom the Syme Room is named, and as almost all of you know, all of you do know, the 1960s were an incredibly partisan and contentious time. The Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, open housing. And this church was riven by those issues. Um, Ken Syme spent, and, and part of this comes from Bob Kemper, my predecessor, my mentor and friend, but Ken Sp Syme ex exerted almost all of his energy trying to keep all those factions from pulling themselves further and further apart. I've talked to several members who at the time, who actually now are since, since past, and they talk about annual meetings in the 1960s when these topics were debated. They would begin for, with dinner at 6 p.m. They would be adjourned at 11 p.m. without a vote and um, without any conclusions. They were an incredibly difficult time. Ken Time retired from this church exhausted. Um, died a year after he retired, wiped out by the experience. He retired in 1971, and um, then 
my mentor, my predecessor, good friend of many of you, Bob Kemper, arrived in 1973. And isn't that right, 1973, right? And uh, served 25 years as our senior pastor. It brought this church to a point where civil discourse, theological discourse and disagreements could be engaged in, um, in healthy and thoughtful manners. Part of that came from the, the growth of adult, what we used to call adult education, but now we call adult faith formation. That really was um, a really significant piece of this church from the 1970s and 80s, and, and still is, but in those times, we used to have upwards of 100 people in the adult education classes on Sunday morning. We used to have three of them at any one point. And, and to me, that was a, um, an essential piece of, that, that Bob brought to, to the rhythm and pattern of our church is because it's one of the ways that a congregation can take on contentious and controversial issues and discuss them um, as opposed to um, have them simply splinter the church. Because you should know, in the 1960s, um, Ken Sign did work so diligently to hold this congregation together. However, the United Church of Christ had been formed just in 1957, and there was a portion of this congregation that was very distrustful of the denomination. The denomination um, almost in 1963, well, in 64, just before the um, <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson, Barry Goldwater election, the denomination came really close to endorsing a candidate um, for the presidency, which um, absolutely drove people bonkers over that. And um, uh, a group in our, I've talked to, I've talked to Kent Taylor about this because he was on the committee. A group was formed to look into the backgrounds of the United Church of Christ national leaders. Kent knew this was not going to be the case, but he was glad to help settle this down for socialist influence in 1963 and 64. And so um, this church was struggling in the 1960s to keep itself together. But people like Kent Taylor and um, Ken Means and, and Joe Means and, and Peggy Taylor and others who were the young families in this church who engaged the church and asked them to continue to engage in, in justice movements without thinking of them as political. And so, um, so now we come to uh, the pandemic. I, um, in September, begin my 25th year as senior minister. Now, by the way, that's a really uncommon experience that you've only had four senior ministers since 1942, um, which is when Ed Manthei came, Ken Syme, Bob Kemper, and now myself. And I'll just finish with this. All I can say is, it'll be interesting, most of us will be long gone, but it will be interesting when someone does the history of the First Congregational Church in 50 years and reflects back on the once every century um, pandemics that churches encounter. By the way, I looked into the annual meeting notes, all of 1918, all of 1919, when the Spanish flu was raging across the United States. And here as well, much broader spread, much more lethal, about four times as many deaths with about a third as many people in the United States. And in our annual meeting notes, nothing, not a word. I don't know. Um, not a single word about changes or, because many churches did stop meeting in person during the Spanish flu because it was so contagious. Um, but we have not a word. Well, we've had a lot going on. All I can say is it'll be interesting. I would love to hear sometime how they reflect on how these last 18 months have gone. But thanks for listening. Do you have any questions? What, anything that, what's the most surprising to you about all that I shared? Was there anything new to any of you? What was the most surprising? India. And Gandhi. And Gandhi, yes. Yeah, Reverend Ralph Kiton. And he, though, maybe his, he grew up... <clears throat>
a, on a rural farm in Minnesota, and so was used to, I think, a fairly um, rough, I mean, rough life. He was obviously very bright. He was a star student at Chicago Theological Seminary, and, but then almost immediately went out after. He and his wife were actually married in the other church, and Women's Society threw he and his wife a little reception, and then they were off to be our ministers abroad. He was our minister abroad. Mary Jo. It, it, it was very controversial. Mary Jo, if you couldn't hear it, and I know those at home couldn't hear it, um, in, the, in the late 60s, uh, Don Benedict was head of the Community Renewal Society at the time, and he was very connected with this church. And this church, in one of its adult education sessions, brought out a Black Panther to talk about the Black Power Movement. Um, some people looked back on that and thought that was, as Mary Jo did, that was just great. I will guarantee you, though, there were some people who were not happy about that as well. <laughs> I'm just going to say it was. Anybody else? Thank you. Very interesting, Rich. <clears throat> Is there any other business to come before Women's Society tonight? If not, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you very much for coming out. <laughs>